Yo, let's talk about Africa, but not the cool, vibrant Africa you see on Instagram. Let's get real, people. Let's rewind to 1884. Picture this. A bunch of European dudes in fancy suits sitting around a table in Berlin. They're not there for a beer fest, though I'm sure there was plenty of that, too. They're there to carve up a whole continent like it's a birthday cake. That, my friends, was the Berlin Conference. No African leaders were invited, by the way. Imagine planning a party and not inviting the birthday boy or girl. That's cold, man. These European powers, they were all about civilizing Africa, which basically meant grabbing all the resources they could get their hands on. Rubber, diamonds, gold, you name it. They drew lines on a map, dividing up Africa into colonies without a single thought about the people who actually lived there. Talk about bad guests. This conference, it screwed up Africa big time. Those arbitrary borders, they're still causing chaos today. The legacy of colonialism is alive and kicking, my friends, and it's not pretty. So you've got these European guys drawing lines on a map. They didn't care about the different ethnic groups, the languages, the cultures. It was like they took a bunch of crayons, went wild on a blank piece of paper and said, boom, there's your country now. You had tribes split in half, enemies forced to live side by side, and traditional grazing routes cut off. It was a recipe for disaster, and boy did it backfire. Suddenly, people who had been living their lives for centuries were told they were now citizens of this new country with different rules, different languages, and often different religions. And guess what happens when you force people together who have nothing in common and a history of conflict? That's right, things get messy. This is where the seeds of so many of Africa's problems were sown. Let's talk about the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC for short. This place is a textbook example of how colonial borders can mess a country up. See, the Congo is rich, like crazy rich. Diamonds, gold, coltan, that stuff in your smartphone. You name it, the Congo's got it. But here's the thing. Those resources have been more of a curse than a blessing. King Leopold II of Belgium, he ran the Congo as his own personal piggy bank, brutalizing the locals and stealing everything he could get his hands on. Millions died under his rule. And after independence, things didn't get much better. The Cold War turned the Congo into a proxy battleground with the US and the Soviet Union backing different sides. Today, the Congo is still struggling. Armed groups are fighting over resources. The government is corrupt, and the people are caught in the middle. Now let's hop over to Nigeria, Africa's most populous country. This place is a melting pot of over 250 ethnic groups, all crammed together within borders drawn by the British. It's like they took all the ingredients for a delicious jollof rice, but instead of mixing them properly, they just threw them in a pot and hoped for the best. The problem? Those colonial borders lumped together groups with long-standing rivalries, competing interests, and different ideas about how the country should be run. This has led to, you guessed it, conflict. The Biafran War, which raged from 1967 to 1970, was a brutal reminder of these divisions. And it's not just about ethnicity, my friends. You've got the Muslim-majority North, and the Christian majority South, each with their own cultural and religious practices. Nigeria is a giant, no doubt, but it's a giant with a serious case of growing pains. Section 5, South Sudan independence couldn't erase the lines. South Sudan, the world's youngest nation, got its independence from Sudan in 2011 after decades of civil war. You think, new country, fresh start, right? Wrong. Turns out you can't just erase decades of colonial meddling and ethnic tensions with a declaration of independence. See, even though South Sudan was now separate from Sudan, the same old problems remained. The Dinka and the Nuer, the country's two largest ethnic groups, continued to clash over land, resources, and political power. In 2013, just two years after independence, South Sudan plunged into a brutal civil war that lasted for five long years. This brand new country, full of hope and promise, shattered by the same old divisions that the colonial powers had exploited for centuries. It's a tragic reminder that true independence means more than just drawing new lines on a map. Section 6, the Sahel, a region adrift in the desert wind. Let's shift gears and head to the Sahel, that semi-arid belt stretching across Africa just south of the Sahara Desert. This region is a textbook example of how colonial borders can exacerbate existing problems. The Sahel is facing a perfect storm of challenges, climate change, poverty, weak governance, and you guessed it, 
conflict fueled by those darn colonial borders. See, the Sahel cuts across several countries, including Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, and Chad, all of which were carved up by the French. These borders slice through traditional grazing routes used by nomadic pastoralist communities, forcing them to compete for dwindling resources. Add to that the rise of extremist groups like Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, who exploit local grievances and the poorest borders to wreak havoc, and you've got a recipe for disaster. The Sahel is a stark reminder that the consequences of colonialism don't stop at borders. Section 7, Pan-Africanism, a dream deferred, but not denied. Okay, so we've talked about the problems, but what about solutions? Well, some visionary Africans had an idea way back when. They said, hey, why are we letting these colonizers divide and conquer us? That, my friends, was the birth of Pan-Africanism. Think of it like a giant family reunion, but for an entire continent. Pan-Africanism is all about unity, solidarity, and self-reliance. It's about recognizing that despite our different cultures, languages, and experiences, we're all in this together. We're all Africans. Leaders like Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, and Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, they champion Pan-Africanism, fighting for independence and a united Africa. And who could forget the great Patrice Lumumba of the Congo? He dared to dream of a Congo free from foreign exploitation, a Congo for the Congolese. Pan-Africanism might have lost some steam after the independence era, but the dream is far from dead. Section 8. Neocolonialism, the empire strikes back with a suit and tie. So the Europeans packed up their bags and left, right? Independence achieved. Well, not so fast. See, colonialism might be dead, but its sneaky cousin, neocolonialism, is alive and well. It's like that ex who keeps showing up at your door even though you broke up years ago. Neocolonialism is all about control through less obvious means. Think economic dependence, political interference, and cultural manipulation. Instead of sending in the troops, neo-colonial powers use things like debt traps, unfair trade agreements, and media propaganda to maintain their grip on former colonies. They say, we're here to help, but it's more like, we're here to help ourselves to your resources. Neo-colonialism is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and it's time we called it out for what it is, a continuation of exploitation and control by other means. Section 9, plunder in the digital age from diamonds to data. Remember all those resources we talked about, the gold, the diamonds, the oil? Well, those are just the tip of the iceberg. In this digital age, there's a new kind of plunder going on, data. That's right, your personal information, your online activity, your digital footprint, it's all up for grabs, and guess who's cashing in? Big tech companies, mostly based in the West, are collecting vast amounts of data from Africa, often without the consent or knowledge of users. They use this data to target advertising, influence consumer behavior, and even sway elections. And it's not just data. African countries are being locked into unfair agreements that benefit foreign companies at the expense of their own citizens. It's time for African countries to wake up and smell the data exhaust. Section 10, building a future without borders in the mind. Okay, so we've covered a lot of heavy stuff, but don't worry, I'm not about to leave you feeling hopeless. So what can be done? How do we move beyond this legacy of exploitation and division? Well, for starters, we need to acknowledge the problem. We can't fix what we don't acknowledge. We need to dismantle the systems of neo-colonialism. That means renegotiating unfair trade deals, promoting fair trade practices, and investing in local industries. It means holding corporations accountable for their actions and demanding transparency in resource extraction. But most importantly, we need to change the narrative. We need to stop seeing Africa through the lens of poverty, war, and corruption. We need to celebrate its diversity, its resilience, its creativity. It's time for Africa to write its own story. 